Before I, I get started on today's message, um, I just want to say thank you again. Um, I'm so proud to lead this church of amazing people. Um, many of you, I know, have heard and even were here at the memorial service yesterday for um, Tabitha Mary Migwi, who tragically died in a car accident last week, who was killed instantly. Some of you may not have heard that, may not have known that. Um, their mother, Kristen, and uh, their, her grandparents, Don and Ruth Slaybaugh, are missionaries in, in our church. They're amazing people. They're uh, a part of the family of Hope Church. And yesterday, we had an amazing time of uh, remembering and celebrating uh, Tabitha's life. And I just want to say thank you for the support, the outpouring of love that you guys have bestowed. The family thanks you. They are blown away by your support, your love, and your generosity to them this time in their life and what they're going through. And I also want to encourage you to not stop, to keep going, because, you know, uh, the grieving process is not just a week. It, this is something they're going to have to live out and walk through um, for a long time. And so they're going to need to have your continued support and love and outpouring to help them through it, all right? So bless you guys. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're about to start this uh, new sermon series um, called The Lifestyles of the Rich and Glorious. And so you might have seen, you know, the pictures out in the lobby. You might see all this paraphernalia up here. And uh, you might even be wondering, you know, what's, what's this all about? You know, why, why are we, uh, you know, admiring gold and money and all these things? And, and that's, that's really not the point. But we're going to have a little fun with this series because I think once you get on the topic of money... You know, people start, uh, their eyes start twitching a little bit, and uh, they start wiggling in their chairs a little, they start reaching for their wallets, and it makes people a little bit uptight. And so I want you guys to be able to just relax. We're going to have fun with this series. I believe this is God's heart for his church. Um, the more I have researched this and studied it, the more I've gotten excited about sharing what God is showing me to you guys. Uh, we serve, how many of you know about God of abundance? Yeah. And uh, in his kingdom, there's more than enough. And yet there is this dichotomy between heaven and earth. And there are kingdom principles between heaven and earth. And, and I, how many, you know, principles are really great, but you can't have a principle without having a prince. And so if you try to take principles and you try to put them to work without really being yielded to the prince behind the principles, sometimes they don't work out so well. And even though you may benefit, and you could see in the world, and even uh, you look at you know, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, wondering why he sees you know, people that are not following God, and even David in the Psalms talks about and wondering and questioning God, why is it that people don't follow you, they're so blessed? Well, they tap into principles, okay? There are principles around money and finances that work. They work regardless of you following God or not. The difference is, when you apply the principle in a way where you honor the prince and the one who gives, then your life will prosper beyond money. That's the difference. The Bible says, I wish that your soul would prosper, uh, that you would prosper even as your soul prospers. And so there is this prosperous um, aspect of the soul, and so my message today is called Soul Provider soul provider, because God doesn't want to just be a, a provider for you. He's not, a, he's not a genie in a bottle that we can go to and even apply some of the, the, the principles of, of sowing and reaping and giving, but I'm afraid that in the church today, there's been some really erroneous teachings around prosperity, and some biblical, really solid biblical teachings. There's some of those out there too. As I've studied, there's some really good material out there that's biblical, and it's truth, but there's also a lot that, in my opinion, is, is false, and it's not healthy, it's not good, and there's this prosperity um, concept that has come to the church um, that has given, I think, a lot of us this false expectation of what we can expect by giving. How many of you know if you're giving to receive something, you're not giving in the right spirit? You're missing the point. And so this is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Because what Jesus did, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. And he took the things that were in the Old Testament, he took the law, 
and he said, now that law is going to be written on your heart. And so now it's not a list of the, to do and to don't. Now it's out of your heart. And so how many of you know if, if giving 10% makes you a little bit nervous, in Jesus' economy, there is no 10%. It's give out of your heart. And how many of you know that oftentimes when I've asked God, it's more than 10% that he's wanting me to give. And it's not about the money. Let me preface that. And today is really going to be about setting the stage for the rest of this series. And uh, you might be thinking, well, this is really you know, odd or boring that you know, we're going to talk about money in church. Let me tell you something. Jesus talked more about money than any other subject. Any other subject. More than heaven and hell combined. More than heaven and hell combined. So what does that tell us? That tells us that this is an extremely important topic. And it is extremely close to the heart of God. Because you know why? Money, and, and we, we equate money with physical money. I don't believe that is, um, I believe that it is so much more than that. If you look at, at the Greek word that when Jesus is talking about, you can't serve God and money, he's actually talking about the word mammon. And that may seem like a really weird word. It sounds like mammal, but it's not. It's mammon. But this word mammon is so much more encompassing than just money. It's actually the spirit behind it. It's the spirit of the world. It's a spirit that would take anything away from you being completely sold out, devoted to God. It actually has a connotation of slavery. And you can see you have two choices. You can only be a slave to one thing or another. But you can't be a slave to both. And what God is asking you is, who has your heart? Because mammon, money, is God's greatest competitor. It's God's greatest competitor for the hearts of men and women. And all he's after is your heart. It's not about the money. It's about your heart. It's about who has a hold of you. Do you have a hold of your money? Or does your money have a hold of you? And you might be sitting here as I did, as I contemplated this, and, and this can kind of be heavy, but I've, I've been in prayer and even in pre-service prayer where you're praying for you that your hearts and minds would be open and that you would have a revelation of really what has a hold of you because I can guarantee you that you might be sitting there and thinking, yeah, money doesn't have a hold of me. But as I've gotten into this, if you're anything like me, I found that there's areas where it has a lot more hold of us than we really think. I want you to think about this. I'm going to pose a question for you. And I want you to think about this for a second. How many times a day do you think about money? How many times a day do you make a decision based off of money? If you think about that for a minute, it's quite a bit. It's actually a lot. I started thinking about, oh my gosh, all the decisions that I make throughout the day, how many of them come down to pure dollars and cents? And I don't believe that that's the way that God wants us to live. And that's why I've entitled this series, Lifestyles of the Rich and Glorious. And obviously, it's a little pun for those of you who remember um, the lifestyles of the rich and famous, where they go in, you know, caviar and champagne dreams, and they go in and show you these mansions and yachts, and, and, and everybody's enthralled with, you know, how these lifestyles, how these people that are so rich and famous live, and it was so glamorous, you'd see all the good things about it. And you know what it reminds me of? It actually reminds, reminds me of, if you want to break it down to a more modern day level, it reminds me of Facebook. <laughs> Isn't Facebook kind of like our lifestyle of the rich and famous? What we do on Facebook is we want to post all the glamorous things about ourselves, the best looking pictures, the times when we're the happiest, the times when we're, you know, buy our new car, our house, or we want to show the world how wonderful our life is, how good we look, and, and all the great things about our life. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Hear me out. I'm not against Facebook. I go on Facebook. I, I think it's a, it can be a great tool. But just like anything in this life, it can be good or it could be bad. You have positive and negative to both. And, and what it is is we want to have balance, right? And so 
I see this trend in America where, where people, even social media, and even if you look on TV and reality shows, that has opened up this whole new paradigm where the average person now can become famous. And there's this need to want to be important, to be known. And that comes out of how God created you. He created you for intimacy. Intimacy is this thing built into you and me that wants to, to be known by somebody, to know and to be known. That's the true essence of intimacy. And yet with modern technology, we, we are in this time and this age and space where um, relationships have become so different. I remember, you know, my wife and I, we used to go visit my grandparents and they were in this community, a retirement community, a sleepy little town called Barefoot Bay in, in Florida, Sebastian, Florida. And it was this retirement community. And we used to go down there and we loved it because they didn't watch TV. They didn't um, get on their cell phones. They weren't on Facebook. What they did is they would get together with their friends and they'd play cards. And they'd, have, they'd share meals together. It was fellowship. It was real. They had relationships that lasted over 50 years. Real friendships that if something happened, they would be there for them in a minute. And now we're in this age where we think because, you know, we, we post something on Facebook and we have all these friends on Facebook and followers on Twitter and all these things that we're, we're wealthy with friends. And the reality is, is our relationships have become more and more and more and more shallow. How many of you know that wealth and, and being rich, and we're going to get into a definition of rich here in a little bit, is so much more than pure money? You know, I was talking with, with my, my friend and brother Dennis, and he was saying that in worship he was looking at, into the eyes of this, this boy here, and we're about to send these you know, boxes to um, places where third world countries where they're needy, where a little red stuffed animal like that that right now is probably tossed in the corner of my kid's room somewhere along with 50 others, where one little red thing like that is going to make such a huge difference in his life. He's going to love that. He's going to cherish it. But life is so much more um, rich. Being rich is so much more than just about having money. It's about having a rich, full life. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be rich. Not in the sense that you have all this money stored up in your bank and you have cars and all those things. Yeah, he wants to take care of you. But he wants to take care of your needs. But he also wants you to have an abundance. Why does he want you to have abundance? Not for yourself so you could have these great big mansions and all these things. He wants you to have an abundance so that you can give. Because our God is a giver. How many of you know, for God so loved the world, he did what? He he gave. That's who he is. He's a giver. He gives freely, and he gives with no strings attached. And that's exactly what he wants to do through and in his people. I was reading a, about a man. He was a very, very wealthy man, a rich man in his worldly perspective, and he was determined to take all his wealth with him when he goes. He's like, I've worked all my life. I have saved up. I've I've done my 401k, I have all this wealth, and doggone it, when I go, I'm taking it with me. So he told his wife, he said, listen, this is, I've been thinking about this, and I've come up with a plan. Here's the plan. When I, uh, when I die, I want you to take all of my money out of the safe, and I want you to put it in this big bag, and I want you to take it and go up to the, um, go up to the attic and hang it on one of the rafters there. This way, when I die and I pass from this life and I, on my way to heaven, as my spirit is leaving my body and I'm caught up to heaven, I will grab it on my way up and take it with me. <laughs> and so his wife, you know, the good, faithful wife that she is and obedient to his wishes, she did just that. Well, it just so happened several years later, the man happened to pass away and um, he passed away and she waited five minutes and then she ran upstairs to the attic to see if the bag was gone. And sure enough, she gets to the attic and she sees the bag is still hanging there. And she says, dang it, I knew I should have put it in the basement. <laughs> Just a little humor there. You know, Jesus said we can't take it with us when we go. And ain't that the truth? We brought nothing into this world, we'll take nothing out, except for the treasure 
that we've stored up in heaven. And that's the difference. And we'll go through that. But today I just want to lay some foundational uh, groundwork, if you will, for the rest of this series that I think is really key that we have an understanding of, that we can build off of. And I, I really believe that God, if you'll let him through this, he will show you some truth that you can apply to your life, that you can walk out, apply to your everyday life. That will make such a huge difference on the way and the perspective that you have on life, on money, and how God wants to be your sole provider. Now, I told you we had a little fun with this series, so um, we got together as a staff and we thought, you know, we might take a little picture, and uh, this is what we came up with. This clicker, man, I think we're going to have to get a new clicker. This has really been, uh... oh, there it goes. Okay, so... Yeah, this is, uh, we had a little fun with this as a staff, you know. Don't take this too serious. It's really just a joke. But we thought, hey, we like to have fun. And uh, so we thought we'd kind of show, you know, you guys have heard of like Preachers of L.A. and stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we thought we'd just have a little fun with this, you know, since money is such a serious topic. We like to have a good time here at Hope Church. So uh, we got together for this uh, picture. I love I love Mitch there. Mitch is, you know, he's like the, the bodyguard chauffeur. He's, he's going to mess anybody up who messes, you know, with the man. So it's good times here. So what I want to do this morning, and we're going to pray, and I'm having trouble with this guy, so I'm just going to have you do it if you could do it up there. I can't see you too well. If you guys can, can click it. Okay, that's good. Um, I'm going to start by sharing with you some things. You know, in America, we have today this obsession with wealth and with fame. This obsession with wealth and fame, and it's getting worse. And I'm afraid that as I look out into Christian culture today, that a lot of what the world is envying, a lot of what the world, uh, the way the world is moving, that, it, that is creeping into the church. It is creeping into Christian lifestyles. Now, God called us to be holy. What, what, what holy actually means, that word holy actually means, is to, means to be set apart. And even though we're in this world, we're not supposed to be of it. The Bible says, one of my favorite verses in Romans 12, 1, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know God's pleasing and perfect will. And so even though we're in this world and we're not supposed to be, you know, called out and, and hide in the, up in the hills somewhere, that we're supposed to be a city on a hill, we're supposed to be the salt and the light of this world. God's plan from the beginning was to use his people, his sons and daughters, as a model for the nations, for them to be able to look at and see the glory and riches of God. That's his plan. But unfortunately, this, this thing called money or mammon has pulled our hearts away oftentimes, and it has disrupted and it has tarnished the church. It has tarnished God's plan. And so I want to start just by sharing with you what I thought were some staggering statistics about this culture and this generation that is coming up. And you can see here, 81% of 18 to 25-year-olds, which is called Gen Y or um, uh, Gen, Gen X generation, 18 to 25 year olds surveyed in a Pew Research Center poll said getting rich is their generation's most important or second most important goal. Most important goal in life, getting rich, having wealth. 51% said the same thing about being famous. So you see, there's this obsession with riches and fame. Riches and glory. In, in the words of uh, Nacho Libre, I just want a taste of the glory. <laughs> right? One of my favorite movies. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but it's so true. Everybody just wants a little taste of the glory. They just want a little bit of fame, a little bit of fortune. And, you, you know, many of us have grown up, and when you've grown up, you know, for a while there, I wanted to be this rock star and be in a band, and, you know, or I wanted to be a pro football player. And, you know... It kills me now because you look at sports and everything, and I, man, I really don't like the way I see our culture going. It's all about me. It's all about what I did. It's I score the touchdown and I do this, you know, funky chicken dance, and, and it's all, I jump into the stands and it's my glory. It's all about my glory. 
You know, we got a picture out in the lobby of LeBron James. They call him the king, King James. You know, in America, we've, we've worshipped a lot of kings, right? Elvis Presley, the king. Michael Jackson, the king of pop. LeBron James, King James. There's a lot of kings that we worship in our culture today, but it's not the true king of glory. And it, it grieves me a little bit. Look at this one. One in three people are moderate to advanced celebrity worshipers, according to one recent national study of 600 people. Celebrity worshipers. Yeah, we just, had, we just came together praising and worshiping God. There are people we don't think of worship in a sense where we worship celebrities, but the reality is we are a culture that is fixated on the famous, on the rich, the ultra-wealthy, the rich. We're fascinated by it. We have TV shows about it. It's unbelievable, this fascination around rich and fame. And even it creeping into the church today now, where it scares me a little bit, where you see these celebrity pastors, right, that are building mega churches around one man. That's scary. That's a very, very dangerous and slippery slope. And I think we have to guard ourselves. And as a leader of the church and as a shepherd of people, my heart is to wait, have the church wake up to the reality of what God says about all this, what his plan from the beginning was, and how we've kind of strayed from that, and now how we can get back on track as a church and truly follow after God. Because what he wants is he wants his people to be rich. He wants his people to be glorious, but not glorious for ourselves. He wants us to be rich so that we could give glory to him. That people would look at our lives and say, wow, there is something unique and different about these people. And they're attracted to us, not because of our great riches and wealth materially, but because we are so rich in generosity and love, and we're rich people in the community that love that we share with one another. They will know that we are Christians by our love. You can't love both God and money. It doesn't work. God's plan is that we would be so generous with our time, our talents, and our treasures that we would literally change and transform this world because I can guarantee you this, there is absolutely nothing more important to the world than money. Money equals power. It equals fame. It equals a lot of things to the world. And they don't understand it. It messes with their gourd when they see people that give money away with no expectation of anything in return. That's otherworldly, that is supernatural, that is not natural. But yet, that's God's plan. If you guys could go to the next slide. Another survey by, from college freshmen, the percentage of who say it is essential or very important to be very well off financially grew this is staggering. From almost 42% in 1967 to seven, almost 75% in 2005. That's almost double. So you can see the trend. Developing, listen to this one, developing a meaningful philosophy of life, which would include God, the Bible, what it means to uh, be alive and have an afterlife, dropped in importance from 85 0.8% in 1967 to 45% in the year 2005. Staggering, scary, really. You see this trend. Something has to be done. There has to be a uh, revival in the church that spills out into our culture, into the world, that shows them what the real meaning and purpose of life is. It's not about being rich from a, from a uh, worldly perspective. It's about being rich in spirit. Next slide. So let's get into a definition of what it means to be rich. So I just went to the dictionary, pulled this up. Rich means having wealth or great possessions, duh, obviously. But I love some of these secondary uh, definitions of what it means to be rich, and I underline this one because I think it's so good. Abundantly supplied with resources. Abundantly supplied with resources. Means or funds, being wealthy. Again, this is 
so much more. I want to challenge you to take your minds off of natural wealth and to broaden your perspective a little bit on what it means to be rich and wealthy. We're going to get in um, probably in, in the next message a little bit about some statistics about where we stack up in, compared to the world for money perspective, pure money. It's going to make you feel really rich. So come prepare. Come, you know, in your Mercedes and your smoking jackets and uh, come feeling rich because when you walk out, you're going to feel tremendously blessed. Even though there may be some of you today that you walked in the doors this morning under tremendous financial pressure. You may now feel rich when you have a stack of bills up here. We're going to talk a little bit about that too because I don't believe that's God's plan for you. It is not his plan for you to walk around under this cloud of stress, having to work more, work harder, grind to the bone to get, just get by and pay your bills. There is so much more to this life than just that. There's so much more in your heart that you want to do, but you can't even do because you are, you are a, a ball and chain to this thing called debt, this thing called mammon, money. And you may not feel like you have a love for money, but the reality is, is we have this thing called the American dream. And we feel we've got, gotten accustomed to a certain type of lifestyle here in America where if, if we don't have a, new, a newer car, or we don't have certain things in our lives, we feel underprivileged. We feel like we need to work harder. We need to get a better job. We need to make more money. And it's this never-ending cycle of never being satisfied, never having enough, always striving for more and more to get ahead. I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend the rest of my life like that. God's got so much greater things for us to do than to just live in that cycle. It's a terrible place to be, yet most people, even in the church, if we're honest with each other, we say, yeah, that's my life. When I hit the snooze button tomorrow morning and I got to go to work, I'm going to work Monday through Friday. I don't even like what I do, but I'm going to make a paycheck. God never called you to try to make a living. He called you to make a life. But the reality is, is most of us spend our time, our resources, our energy. Think about how much energy we spend just trying to make a living. God has a higher plan. And I hope through the power of the Holy Spirit that he's equips me to be able to share with you some of the things that I see in Scripture. And I believe that if we'll allow him to take us from the plane that we're living on and, and help us to come up higher, that he's got such a better plan for us, church, such a better plan for us, that we can live and walk and have a lifestyle where we are walking in freedom and not bondage to anything in this earth so that we can be free to truly pursue the dreams that God has planted in your heart. The Bible says that he knew the good works that you would do before you were even born. He had planned them for you ahead of time. He has got things for every single one of you. It's, this thing isn't just for me. It isn't just for the pastors. It isn't just for the leaders of the church. If we're going to change the world, it's going to take a revelation from the body of Christ and the sons and daughters of the Most High God to get a revelation that God wants to use you. Yes, you. you. You're sitting here this morning and you think, what do I have to give? I'm not talented. I don't have, you know, I don't have the gift to speak to people. You have a gift. And some of you, it's locked inside of you because you've been believing, you, you have actually mentally put yourself in a box because you believe yourself to be a certain way. I had this, uh, I felt like it was a prophetic word several weeks ago, and I forgot about it, and the Holy Spirit just reminded me of it, that there's some of you that people have told you you're a certain type of person, you have these certain type of giftings, and, and because of that, you, you are in this box of, of being limited by that expectation of who you are and even in your own mind of what you can and cannot do. And God wants to come along and he wants to shatter that box. He wants to take your 10 pegs and he wants to expand them. He wants to broaden your horizons. He wants to blow your mind with what he wants to do in you and through you. But you have to be willing to let yourself imagine even just for one minute while you're sitting here today that even the things you've believed about yourself all your life, that God can do something extraordinarily amazing in and through you that's way bigger, way different than you ever thought. Isn't that what faith is all about? But you have a choice in this thing. 
as we all do, you can choose to stay in that place if you want, and God will use you, no doubt, but he's got so much more, church. There is so much more that he has for you, and this area of money is a big, big, big deal. So God, I pray right now, and I invite you, Holy Spirit, to just tear down the walls of all our thinking about money, about Bible, about the church and money, and all the, the junk that's happened in and throughout the church over history. This isn't about getting more money into the church. This is about getting more people into the kingdom. It's about a real relationship with you. You're a good God, and you're a generous God, and you're a giver, and you want your people to be generous and to give, and you want us to have more than enough. You're a God of abundance, so God, help me to communicate effectively your word and your truth this morning, and open our eyes and our ears to be able to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So next slide, uh, I thought since we're doing a definition of rich, we might as well do a definition of glorious as well. The glorious means having worthy of, or bringing fame or admiration. A secondary definition would be having a striking beauty or splendor that evokes feelings of delighted admiration. Now, when I think about this, when you take those two, rich and glorious, and this is why this message series is called Lifestyles of the Rich and the Glorious, is because God's plan for his people, his chosen people, is that they would be so rich And they would be so full of his glory that they would ultimately bring glory to him and they would bring many to know him. But in order to really see this, anytime I've ever wanted to know what is God's plan with something, I always go back to the beginning. I go back to two things, actually. I go back to the beginning, the first Adam, creation. Why did he create us a certain way? Why did he do this? And then I go to the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. Because things change drastically going from the first Adam to the second Adam. And so what I want to do is start us off this morning by taking you to Genesis and taking a look at God's original plan for us in his provision. So if you guys can go to the next slide. It's out of Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 if you have your Bibles otherwise you can just read along. And this is obviously after... Um, Adam took the apple from Eve and uh, partook of the apple, disobeyed God, and now God has confronted Eve already, and now he's confronting Adam, and he says to this, and he said to the man, since you listen to your wife, guys, that'll teach you to listen to your wife, right? I mean, come on. Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. And now listen to this. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. How many of you feel like you can relate to that? How many of you feel like you've been in a place where you, you're striving, it just it feels so hard, it feels like you are struggling just to survive, just to get by, just to pay the bills, to scratch a living? Well, this is why. You could blame it all on Adam and Eve. They blew it for you. Because that was not God's plan. God's original plan for man was that he placed him in the garden. He placed him in this beautiful, lush place where he didn't have to work for anything. All he had to do was be and have this relationship, this real relationship with the living God where they would walk together in the cool of the day and they would talk to each other just like a man would face to face. They had this beautiful face-to-face relationship. God never planned for Adam to have to toil, to strive, and to work to get what he needed. He always planned from the beginning what he created, he would provide for. God's will is God's bill. He takes care of it. And so Adam was in this place where he didn't have to work for what he had, but this is what he did have to do. This is what Adam's assignment It was to steward well what God had provided. There was more than enough in the garden. There was plenty of food to eat. There was plenty of beauty. There was lush gardens. There was beautiful things that only I can imagine 
in my wildest dreams. But he never had to work for it. It was right there for him. So God's plan from the beginning was not that you would have to work for what you had, that he would provide for you, that that wouldn't be something you had to worry about. But what your assignment would be, rather than trying to make money, to make provision, to get provision, your assignment rather would be to steward well what God gave you. That was his plan from the beginning. And it was more than enough to steward. It was plenty. But at the fall, now there's this curse from this moment forward that you're going to have to toil. You're going to have to struggle. And so here we are. We're in this life. And the reality is, is we got bills to pay. We got things we need to write checks for. And, you know, even though uh, money may not be a big deal to God, and it's not, it sure helps down here, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, people say money makes the world go round to a certain degree. That's true. You can't really do anything without it. And so it represents so much more than just a, a physical cash or, a, or some numbers that you see on a screen that represent your bank account or savings account. It's so much bigger than that. So now we have this curse. And then moving forward, it's time to have, okay. Moving forward, you see that God, and I'm going to fast forward a lot here. Now we're back and, and Israel was his chosen people. These were God's people. Now, I love the Old Testament because the Old Testament is a representation of what our life can look like, okay, spiritually speaking today. And so what some of the things that happened in the Old Testament we can see and we can glean from and we can learn from, a lot of it is what not to do, unfortunately. But when we look at Old Testament and we look at God's chosen race, his chosen people, the one he said, I will be your God and you shall be my people too, Israel. Look at what would happen to them. They would worship God, okay? They would experience blessing on their life because they had this amazing relationship with God and he would be their people and he took care of them and he took care of them really well. And then they would get so used to the abundance and the provision that they would get a little bit lax. They would start to like the abundance a little too much and they would start forgetting who was the actual provider of the abundance, and they started worshiping the abundance instead of the one who provided the abundance. And they get into this endless cycle of going through this same thing over the course of history where they would go through periods when they had tremendous abundance and blessing on their life, and it would lead them away, and they would start worshiping false gods. They would make idols out of the very things and the provisions that God provided to them. They would make golden cows, a cow. God provided the, uh, livestock in those days was like money. The more you had, the more wealthy you were. It was also how you eat. Yeah, we know that very well here in Montana. Love our beef. It's awesome. Elk meat's pretty good too. And venison. But they started making golden cows and worshiping golden cows and living things that were created by God. And it just, we read it and we think, that's crazy, that's absurd. And the reality is, is that in our modern culture, we do the same thing. We just do it in different ways. We don't worship cows, so to speak, although some religions do. We worship emblems, like little apples. <laughs> little little emblems, emblems on the front of the car. There's lots of things that we probably worship if we were to get real with each other that is provided from God, but we fixate too much on those things and we forget who the provider of all of them is. And so Israel would go through these times of, of God then getting upset with them and, and to chastise them in a good way. He disciplines those he loves. He would discipline the nation of Israel and he would bring, let enemies come and, and they would... Uh, then at, when their enemies came and put pressure on them, they would cry back out to God and God would come and he would deliver them and then they would come back into seasons of blessing and provision and this endless cycle that would happen. Well, let me fast forward to a time when they were in bondage to the country of Egypt. And they're in this place called Egypt where they were literally slaves to the nation. They were slaves to Egypt Egypt is a representation. There are types and shadows in the Bible, and, and I don't mean to get all you know, too technical on you, but I think, I think it's important that 
we understand this because if you do, I think it will give you a better understanding of, of where we've come from and what God wants to do to take us out. So Egypt was a type and shadow of this world that we live in today. And they were in bondage. They were slaves to Egypt every day, working hard, toiling, sweating, sweating by their brow to just get food and to have shelter from Egypt. And they were yet in bondage to it. They were slaves to it. And I look at that and I think so much I could see that happening even in America today where we, we can become enslaved to this world system and this, need, this constant thing that we have to strive to keep up, to get ahead, to just get by. And we spend all our time and our resources and our energy trying to just live. And they became comfortable in that place until they came to a point, again, where they cried out to God to deliver them. And in his grace and in his mercy and in his love and his unfailing love to us, he delivered them by bringing Moses. And he took them out through the Red Sea. It's a beautiful picture of what happens to us when we're born again. They went through the Red Sea. He parted the Red Sea. The Red Sea is kind of a, a type and shadow of the blood of Jesus and how they, they miraculously got saved through that. And he pulled them out of slavery to Egypt and he bring, brought them into a place of freedom but the problem now was, now that they were out of Egypt and they were out of this bondage and they were out of being slaves, even though they were physically out of it, they were still mentally in chains. And I think that's exactly what happens to us. We come out of this world, we get saved by the grace of God. For those of us who have given our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, we're saved by the grace of God. We come out of this world, but we never get to the place where our, our minds and our spirits are renewed and transformed. We still conform to the pattern of this world. Instead of letting God transform us by the renewing of our mind, by his word and his plan for us. And so we're gonna go on a journey together, church, of, of letting God renew our minds and show us some things about in his word through uh, what he wants to do through riches and glory in and through you. And so you could see even, even their experience going through the desert. Why? Do you know that he could have actually taken them? His goal was to take them to the promised land. Do you know he could have taken them there in a couple of days? They went the long way, 40-day route, 40-year route, rather. Why? Because they weren't ready. They needed to walk through some things. They needed to learn how God provides for them. Instead of being enslaved to Egypt and, and having Egypt provide for them, now they were on this journey of relearning that they actually have a God that wants to provide for them everything, and supernaturally, by the way. As you remember, they didn't have food. Think about it. He brought them through the hardest place in the world. Some places call it a wasteland, the desert, the driest place where nothing grows, there's no water, there is absolutely no physical provision, none. How are they going to survive? The only way they were going to survive was God showing up and providing for them, and he did so miraculously. If you remember, manna in the morning. They didn't like that. They got tired of eating manna. God's so good. They started complaining. I wish we were back in Egypt and we could taste the leeks and the garlic and all the things that we had. We would have been better off back in Egypt where we were slaves, but we had all the comforts and the convenience and the comfort foods that we love so much. Scary, right? When you think of it in light of America today and how much we've become accustomed to crave the comforts of this world and what it provides. It's a scary place to be in because the reality is, is when I read my Bible and I read the New Testament and I read the book of Acts, there wasn't a whole lot of comfort that was going on there. I saw a lot of tribulation, a lot of trials, a lot of suffering, a lot of going without but there was so much glory and richness that was being poured out into their lives. They were storing up treasures in heaven. And we have come so accustomed to living life in this world. Paul talks about thinking about the realities of heaven. 
You know, yesterday, um, and even Friday night, I thought it was so ironic how there was an earthquake in the valley here. An earthquake. Who would ever have thought in Flathead Valley that we would experience an earthquake? I don't, I, I, I might be crazy, but I don't think those things happen by accident. I believe that God is wanting to shake everything that can be shaken, and he's wanting to wake up a people, and it's no, no doubt either it happened around midnight, because he's wanting to wake people up to the reality of where they're living. And it's time that the people of God wake up to the plan of God and what he wants to do in and through us on this earth. Because I still believe in this great country called America. And I still believe that there are great men and women that if we'll rise up into the calling and the purpose and the destiny that God has on our life, that we can change this nation. One town, one city, one valley, one county, one state at a time. But it's going to take an awakening. It's going to take a shaking. And God is wanting to shake everything off, even, even Tabitha's death. As tragic as what, and I can't imagine but at the same time, I believe God is using it to wake people up to the reality of life and death and that there is so much more to life. Our life here on earth is just a little blip on the radar. It's a vapor. It's a flower that is here today and it's dried up tomorrow and it's gone. It's amazing to me. The older I get, the more time goes by fast. Sometimes I look at my kids and I wake up and I think he grew an inch overnight. They're going up so fast, and time is going by. And I think God is wanting to confront us and challenge us. Are you going to continue to live in the place that you are? Are you going to live in the lifestyle that I have called you to live? One that will bring glory to my name and bring many sons and daughters into glory. If you guys can go to the next slide. I'll come to a close here. And I'll end with this. This is out of Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 11. Tiffany's here, if you could come up. It says this. If you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. This is Jesus talking. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Now, if you're sitting here this morning, you're thinking, oh man, you know, I came to hear a good spiritual word this morning. I didn't come here to, to read about money. Let me tell you something, that there is this connection between your spiritual life and money. It is right here. I've seen this at work in my own personal life, and I could share with you testimony after testimony after testimony. I could tell you this, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't been faithful in what God gave me in Earthly riches. That's the truth. You may not be able to accept that, but right here is the proof. This is what Jesus says. He said, what is he trying to say here? He's saying, if you're faithful with little things, you'll be faithful with large ones. So if, if I can give you something as meaningless and as tangible as money, and if you can't be faithful with that, how am I supposed to give you more? Many of us are crying out because we're in debt. We have bills. We, we have uh, fi real financial problems. I'm not denying that. But the reality is if we will be faithful with what we have, God has a promise for you and me that he will be faithful to give you more. But you have to, here's the key, you have to be able to steward well what he's given you. Here's an even bigger key. And I'm going to end on this. You can go ahead. And if you're trustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you? Or if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? That's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about true riches. Jesus isn't talking about gold coins and, and money. He's talking about true riches, about being really, really wealthy, being a rich person, being rich in spirit, being rich in heart, being rich with compassion, being rich in love, being rich in mercy, being rich in grace, being rich in loving kindness. Man, we, we are surrounded by a world that is crying out for significance, for meaning. 
for somebody to show them what it really means to live. And Jesus is saying here that if I can't trust you with physical money, how will I ever be able to trust you with more of my spirit? More of the things even we come to church and we cry out for. We have to be faithful with this physical thing that he's given us. See, it's not about the money. It's never been about the money. God doesn't need your money. He needs your heart. But money shows where your heart is. It shows what has a hold of you. If your money has a hold of you or do you have a hold of your money? It's a question I asked you at the beginning. It's a question I'm going to ask you as we close. And as we leave here today, I want you to continue to think about that. And ask God to show you. David said, search me and know me. Know my ways. Point out any wicked way in me if there's anything. Because I truly believe, church, that if we can get free from this thing called money, this attachment to this worldly life and these things that money represents, then and only then we can truly be free to pursue God with everything that is in us. That's what God wants. That's what he truly wants for you and me. He wants you to have true riches. Would you stand with me? God, I pray that you would stir the hearts of your people. I pray that this word would transform us from the inside out, that it would change the way we think, that it would change the way we look at the world, change the way we look at our money, the way we look at our relationships, the way we would look at our talents, the things that you've blessed us with and give us. I pray that you would continue to speak to us as we get into your word over the next several weeks and that you would change us, God. Put a hunger in us for more of your word and your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.